thank you for enjoying us, and thanks everyone for coming in um, after, I guess, morning breakfast and then some uh, coffee and whatnot. So yeah, we are going to be giving our talk here, uh, 11 tricks to improve your productivity and reduce your frustration with Kubernetes. But due to this lovely thing called inflation, there might be actually more than 11 of them that we actually get into. Um, on the top right corner and will be on the bottom of the slides will be a QR code that actually goes to these slides for if you want to look at them later or whatnot. So yeah, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. I am a developer advocate at VMware. If you are one of the people that still uses Twitter or X, um, my handle is there. And if you use other things, there is a link tree there as well. And I'm Jerome Petazzoni. Uh, I now uh, teach Docker and Kubernetes for a living. My most popular courses are getting started with Kubernetes, and then the even more popular one is getting done with Kubernetes. Uh, so since I live by uh, teaching these classes, if you're interested to level up your team or whatever, come talk to me after the talk. I'll be happy to maybe strike a deal or something. Um, and uh, so another thing is that teaching Docker and Kubernetes is fun but teaching yoga is even funner. So what we're going to do, there's going to be a little bit of audience participation. Each time we are going to tell you about a cool tip and trick with Kubernetes, we're going to ask you to raise your hand to do a little bit of stretching if you already knew that one. So two purposes there. Uh, first, to get to, to do some stretching, uh, and also for us to get a sense of which things are already known by everyone and we should not reuse in a future talk, and which things, on the contrary, are like super new and interesting, and we should definitely talk more about them. Uh, so, and on that, Tiffany, you want to start? Yeah. Also, there's two podiums because I'm so short that I can't be seen behind this one in my laptop, if you're wondering. All right. so. Um, who here has run a cluster in Kubernetes locally? All right, Basically cool. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> Most everybody. Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of options. You may have seen or heard of some of these, maybe not others. Um, like, for instance, I've used Docker Desktop. I've used Kind. There's Minikube. There's OrbStack running on my machine right now because, for whatever reason, one of the other things isn't working at the moment. But basically, there's so many options that you can choose between whatever you might want that is there. Instead of necessarily having to have like the internet and running in the cloud, you can play around on your computer, too. So who here has heard that you could, with Kind, for instance, that you can actually have multiple nodes in your cluster? All right, not nearly as many people. I didn't know about this either beforehand. But basically, yeah, you can have more than one node. So if we go over to my terminal here, if I do Kind create cluster, I have this config that has multiple nodes listed there. And basically, I pulled it, the uh, Docker image earlier, so then it'll just go and create the nodes for that afterward. So if we go back over here, so there's a couple of reasons why you might want multiple nodes. For instance, you might want to deal with something with daemon sets and having something run on every single one of your nodes. Maybe you want to do some sort of like node affinity and be like, hey, I want this to run on this node, but not this one, or with this specific app, but not this one, and whatnot. There's things with fa uh, failures and failover. Basically, there might be a bunch of different reasons why you want to run locally and not have just one node. There's also this cool thing, uh, if you haven't heard of it. So who here has heard of being able to use cube cuddle wait? Okay, also not a lot of people. So hey, new stuff. Um, so you can do cube cuddle wait, for instance, on nodes, and you can do uh, dash dash for, and then give it a condition, such as being ready. There's the ability to add a timeout, and then for this one, there's all. So basically, if you're doing something with like some sort of like CI or having testing scripts, you might want to make sure that your nodes are actually up for all of them before you try running some sort of workload. That way you don't end up having everything running on whatever first node or nodes end up being up, for instance. So this one is already up and running, but if I did a wait on nodes, for instance, you can just see that it's already, um, the condition's already been met. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about are these tools called kubectx and kubeNS. Who has heard of either of those? Yeah. Okay, a little bit more than kubectl wait. Okay. So, yeah, basically for kubectx and kubeNS, they basically let you, for instance, for kubectx, you can switch between different contexts. So, you can easily jump between different clusters that you have in your same kube config. 
And then, or you could have multiple, depending on what your cube config setting is for that. And then there's kubeNS, and that lets you easily switch between namespaces so that you don't have to do like a bunch of cube huddle dash ns or dash s namespace if you're running a bunch of the commands within the same namespace. So for instance, if I go back over here, if I did a cube CTX right now, I also have fzf, which lets me tab, like go between the different ones. So you can see that I have a bunch of different clusters at the moment. I want to just use the kind one, which I was already in. If I did a k create namespace and I call it hello, if I do cube ns, I can see all the namespaces that I have in this cluster. And so I could actually go and switch to my hello one, for instance. So basically now everything that I'm doing is in the hello namespace, so I don't have to go and do dash ns every single time. OK. so. Like with the waiting for nodes, you can also do the same type of thing with other resources as well. So for instance, I could go and create a deployment. So if I wanted to create my hello deployment just using the Nginx image, then you can go and wait for it to be available. So if I go back over here, OK, so I have that. So if I do a wait on deployment, so depending on how fast your internet is, um, in the hotel it took quite a bit longer, hence the timeout that I had added. So basically, it just waits until it is uh, available there. So if I did a K get deployments, and K is just my lazy way of doing cube cuddle because it takes fewer characters. So basically, we can see that that one is up and ready. So if we look here, um, you can. who here has used dash o JSON path or knew that thing? OK. So it lets you be able to get uh, specific like fields or value from specific fields in the JSON that you have for if you did like a dash o uh, JSON, like you could do dash o YAML, dash o JSON, and get a specific thing from there instead of having to use something like grep. So kubectl wait can basically wait on any sort of condition that there is there. So like you can have it on like nodes, you can have it on deployments. There's a bunch of different resources that you can do it with. So basically, if you run this command here, then you can actually see what the different um, conditions that you can run it on are. So if I did, Here, so for your deployments, I can see that my options are available and progressing. Um, it may not show for things like jobs as much, but basically you can kind of use this to figure out what different things you can wait for. All right, now waiting for the deployment to be ready is nice, but often we actually want to wait for a service to be ready and available like, to, to serve requests. And for services, unfortunately, we don't have a condition uh, that would say if the service is ready. But so instead, what we can do is look at the endpoints. So for instance, if I uh, expose that deployment here, and so I probably know that this creates a uh, service, um, but uh, did you also know that this create endpoints? Many uh, half small chunk of people. And so basically, um, the interesting part here is that this endpoints column here, that gets populated only when the uh, endpoints, so the pods are, um, uh, are ready and available. So as long as the pod is not ready, then that endpoints would be blank. So then what we can do uh, is this kubectl wait endpoints with a dash dash for chase on path. Who knew that one? OK, almost nobody, and that's OK, because that's super new. That's in 127, and that particular syntax uh, is in new in 128. Uh, I don't even know if we put that in the abstract, because I feel like I learned that literally last week. Uh, and so the way it works, uh, let's see. Um, it's going to be something like this. Well, in that case, it's not super exciting because obviously the service is already ready. Uh, but when you put a dash dash for JSON path, you can put any JSON path expression and you can either put a specific condition, uh, something like the number of available replicas has to be 10, for instance, or you can put a path like this without an equal sign and it just waits until that particular thing's 
pops up uh, in the uh, in the object. So pretty convenient here. And the dot dot IP, um, just in case you're not super familiar with that JSON path thing, that means find a, a field somewhere that's called IP. I have no idea where it is in the manifest, and I don't care. Just go and like in depth and find that field. So that means basically wait until there is an IP field in the endpoints manifest. Okay, but sometimes we want to do the same, but for a public facing load balancer. Um, so in that case, uh, what we want to do uh, is a wait on the service with, it's a kind of a coincidence that it's the same JSON path because in both cases, uh, the field that we're looking for is called IP, but really pure coincidence. And so here, you know, when you create a service of type load balancer, which I'm not going to do here because we're on a local kind cluster, uh, but normally that would provision a load balancer and that's going to take a little while, uh, a few seconds on some cloud providers, a few minutes on others, and then you might want to wait until that's actually uh, available before uh, going on, and that's one way to do it. Uh, some little details on kubectl wait. Uh, the default timeout, I think you mentioned that, is 30 seconds. Um, and you can change it. Uh, so, for instance, because very often 30 seconds is not enough. Um, so, very often when you're going to try that out, you're going to get the timeout error and bump that to five minutes or so. Uh, you can set it to zero, which means just check right now if the thing is ready or not, and then use the, the, um, the exit status code. Uh, and uh, one last thing is that you can and also wait for object deletion. So if you have a bunch of pods and you're doing, for instance, a rolling update and you're waiting for the old pods to be gone, you can do a cupcuttle wait for delete with a selector matching these pods and that works great. Um, now, something that's not exactly a um, cubicle trick and everything, that's why we put it like seven and three quarters. Um, there is uh, this tool called CAP. Anybody here knows about CAP or CAP? I don't know how to pronounce it. Almost no one. Okay. Uh, that's part of Carvel, which is a bunch of uh, pretty cool open source tools by VMware. And CAP will let you, for instance, do equivalent of a cubicle apply, uh, but it will also wait until the resources act are actually up. So it's kind of bundling all these things that we showed you. Uh, and it's also going to kind of keep track of uh, what it has done so that later you can do rollbacks, et cetera, et cetera. It's a little bit like Helm in some ways, but without the templating engine, just the lifecycle management parts. So if you're into that, that could be exciting. Now, a uh, mandatory ID crow, IT crow joke. Um, so how can we uh, turn off a deployment and then turn it back on again? Uh, well, uh, the usual way that we do this is with kubectl rollout restart. Who knew that one? Uh, lots of people, yeah, normal that I was expecting that. Uh, but uh, so the way it works, and I think that's super nice in Kubernetes, it's not like a magic API call, like restart that deployment. It's just adding an annotation uh, in the pod template in the deployment. Okay, let's see if I can show that one. So I do the rollout restart, yay. Uh, and then uh, I need to get the annotation and uh, it's, yeah, it's adding that annotation in the in the pod template, so it's just using like the normal existing rolling update mechanisms. Uh, it's like, hey Kubernetes, I want to you know deploy a new pod. Uh, what's the difference between the old one and the new one? Oh, I just changed this little annotation, which doesn't alter the behavior of the pod in any way, but forces a rolling update. Now, sometimes you really want to turn it off and on again. Uh, so in that case, you can scale to zero. Who knew that one? Yeah, many people, I guess, because many, I mean, many of us probably have been curious at some point, like what happens if I scale to zero and that works. Now, a good question would be, why would want anyone want to do that? Um, a couple of examples. My favorite one is when you're firefighting in production and you want to turn off something, but you don't want to uh, outright delete it because you know that you will have to restart it after. So maybe there is this walker that is kind of uh, causing a lot of havoc on the platform or whatever. So scale the thing to zero, do whatever you need to do, scale it back up. Uh, that's pretty convenient. That's also useful for auto scale to zero 
scenarios where the stuff where you really want to scale something down to zero. And if you want to do that kind of stuff, by the way, if you've been researching that, uh, have a look at Keda. Um, it's a super awesome project, uh, really excited about it after losing a lot of my sanity, getting stuff like the Prometheus adapter up and running. Uh, Kida was a breeze to get running, so uh, I'm not going to say much more about it because this is not a talk about Kida, but it's really super cool. Anybody knows Kida here? Uh, a few hands, okay, we need more people to know about Keda because it's seriously awesome. Okay, now, fun one, uh, when you want to connect to a service in a different namespace. So the basics could be, well, I don't need anything special, I could just use the cluster IP of that service, so that's kind of level zero, yeah, hard code the cluster IP of the service in my code. Level one would be, well, if I want to connect to the uh, yellow deployment in the blue namespace, uh, you can connect to yellow.blue or even yellow.blue.svc.cluster.local. And so the idea here is that in my code, if my code is using you know, the standard like uh, Kubernetes service discovery where I'm trying to connect to uh, foo, then I'm going to make foo an external name uh, service. An external name service is just a DNS alias pointing to yellow.blue.svc.cluster.local. Uh, anyone ever used external name services for that kind of stuff? Uh, just a few hands. Okay, so that one is cool. We should keep it. All right. I'm not going to show the demo because I'm keeping an eye on time here. And uh, I think you want to do that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So who here has generated a YAML manifest in some way? Okay. Cool. So there's a bunch of different ways that you could start off. Maybe you could go to the docs and copy paste and edit things or you could go to some like go to google or bing or whatever and be like i need the yaml for creating some deployment or ask chat gpt like those all work um, it just kind of can end up taking a while so you can actually go and just use kubectl to create the yaml and not actually create the resource i mean you could also create the resource as well if you really wanted um, who has done it this way with the dash o yaml and the dry run client okay Maybe half of the room. Okay. So if we go back over here. Okay, so, and who has heard of YQ or JQ? Okay, yeah, basically it makes things look a little prettier. But so basically here we can just see like the YAML that is being used that you can then dump into some sort of file and then modify, add different things. Because for instance, some of the kubectl commands, maybe not necessarily for deployments, may not have all the flags that you need to be able to uh, do what you want with things. Sometimes this can be the case with role bindings and you need to change it manually. So you can just do this, which is super helpful for the CCAD based on my experience with that. So then, yeah, you can just create that. So who has heard of kubectl patch? Yeah. Okay, fewer people. So basically you can use it to change something that is in like say for instance your deployment. So for the formatting, you probably recognize some of the YAML stuff that's going on here. And you can see that I have it with a container of smaller Nginx with the name and uh, giving it Nginx Alpine. So right now, um, we currently have hello that just has uh, the single image with having it as Nginx and Nginx, which is super creative. <laughs> um, so if we look here and we do, I'm going to, so right now, we can see that there's just the one that's called Nginx. With, well, the image is Nginx. If we grep the name, it would be the same. So if instead, if I did a K patch, so then if I run this, we, you can maybe guess where things might be going. If I go over and actually run a new terminal window, there's this lovely thing called K9S. Um, so who's heard of K9S? Okay, so basically maybe you prefer having some sort of visual representation in a, still in a CLI style format, still text, not an entirely separate like graphical UI, but basically you can see things like, for instance, we now have this error. It says that one out of two already, if we look into it, we can actually see that this patch ended up not only adding the, having the smaller Nginx, it still has the previous one, and then it's going to fail because they're both trying to use port 80, which is not so great. 
But basically, as a result, this patch added another one. So we can also do a different type of patch where if we go back over here, we can actually go and remove things as well um, from our YAML. So for instance, for this one, it would remove the container that is located at location zero. Um, as far as we are aware at the moment that we can't actually do it like by selecting item by the value. But so we could go and do this and we can go and remove it. So then if we look back over here, we can see now that we have a new pod, it's running mm -hmm. and that there's only one there. So basically, just to reiterate, we patched it, ended up adding another uh, container, and then went and been, realized, hey, this we did this wrong, let's go and remove it. Okay. So who knew that you can do things like labeling columns and showing things by that? Okay, cool. Um, so this is an example with um, <coughs> multiple nodes. You can see that like we added the three things of architecture, instance type, and zone, and you can see which is pretty useful if you're wondering, hey, what is the instance type I have? And you can see that there's different ones here. If I were to just run that on my kind cluster, you wouldn't actually see much of anything since it doesn't have all that specific stuff, like there's no zone running on there. Okay, so who has tried also adding things like cu uh, custom columns? Oh. One, per two people, okay, this one's the least number of hands, okay. So for instance, we can see like uh, basically what controllers are owning our pod. So if we go back to our terminal, So for instance, this is all of the pods that are running on the cluster. You can see the hello one that we created and that is owned by a replica set, which makes sense since that's owned by, a, that there's a deployment there. You can see a bunch of the other ones like for Cube Proxy that you can see it's a daemon set and you can see that Cube Proxy owns it, which is pretty cool and just gives you a little bit more information on things for that. Okay, uh, who has heard of kubectl set? Mm, okay, very short ones, yeah. <laughs> almost no one. Okay, so basically what we were doing earlier, we were trying to use patch to replace like the image name or like the image for our Nginx, which didn't work exactly how we wanted in that specific case. Um, so another way to go about it is to use kubectl set. So then you can actually change what the image is specifically for that. You can do things, do it for different resource types, such as like service count. You can do it set resources. Um, there's a few combinations that don't work. So for instance, you can't use the dash dash selector for the surface account. And then you can do things like uh, dash dash selector and you can have it select the anything that has the label of app and it could change things. You have to be a little careful sometimes with these because maybe you might accidentally, depending on how you write it, Maybe you changed the service account for every single one of your uh, deployments that you had running, which might not be so great. So if we go back over to here. Oops. So if I go and set the image to Nginx Alpine, if I do a grep again, we can see that now the image has been updated to Nginx Alpine. And it was previously just Nginx since we had removed the other one. And then if I were to do a set service account, um, so if I wanted to do it for my specific deployment, technically this will result in errors because the service account doesn't exist, but it's still something that you could do ideally with a service account that actually exists. And then we could do a set resources. And then for instance, for if I had multiple applications running in this namespace, then it would set the memory and CPU for every single one of them. If we did like a k get deployment, we can see that those are set to what we just put it at. 
And arguably, like the, this kubectl set, like I don't expect that somebody would use that in production. Like, oh, I'm just going to kubectl, let's change a bunch of things on my production machines. We've been taught that we should use YAML manifest and embrace GitOps and all that stuff. Um, however, when learning Kubernetes, when figuring how it works, uh, when you have something like add some resource requests, it's super easy and fast to do it that way, like one liner, instead of having to go through, okay, do some kubectl edit, what was the syntax again, etc. Uh, the CLI has the advantage of offering some completion, so in that case, that's uh, uh, pretty convenient. All right, now uh, a little bit about security. We have kubectl of can I, and I suppose many of you knew already about kubectl of, uh, for instance, can I create deployments, which is going to tell me yes, because we're basically cluster admin here. So even if I ask, can I drink coffee, it would tell me yes. Um, but we can also do can I dash dash list, which is going to tell us the permissions that we have, which in that case is not super exciting. We have like stars everywhere because, again, we are cluster admin, uh, or rather we belong to the system masters group, whatever. Uh, that's super useful, though, after creating a role and binding it to a service account or user to check that we did not kind of overflow a little bit and give too many permissions. Or, you know, when doing pen testing, after you successfully compromised some service somewhere, and now you're like, okay, what kind of permissions do I have right now? Um, now, Kepkatel Watch, um, who knew about the dash dash watch? Okay, lots of folks. And the dash dash output watch events? Much less, right? Uh, so that one is mm, kind of nice. I can do something like, uh, uh, so kubectl get pod dash dash watch o wide, and then uh, the output watch events. and. The, the only difference is the first column uh, that says added at this point. Um, and then over time, when we have events happening, we can see modified, modified, modified. Uh, and the thing that I find interesting is when you delete uh, the deployment, uh, the pod at the end, you can see that deleted event, which is something that you don't quite see if you just do a get pods dash dash watch. At the end, you just see one line, but you, nothing tells you that the pod went away. This will tell you. Fun thing, you can add a dash o JSON, so then you get a kind of stream of JSON events, and by combining that with JQ, for instance, you could write your own Kubernetes controllers in Bash because fun. Speaking of writing controllers in Bash uh, and other JSON manipulations, there is Gron. Who knew about Gron? Uh, okay, almost nobody. Uh, my partner told me about that one just like a week ago or so. Uh, it basically transforms structured JSON into JSON with path like this. Uh, so when you don't know exactly where is a particular field, that's super convenient. And then you can even ungrunt to retransform that into a, an object. So really, really cool stuff. Um, and finally, uh, that one is not exactly Kubernetes related, but it definitely helps. Uh, Nixery. Who knows about Nixery? Uh, okay, not enough people, because this is honestly super awesome. Uh, let's say for some reason you need an image uh, with um, like a shell, and I want FFmpeg, and also kubectl, and Terraform, because reasons. So you just nixery.dev slash shell slash all these packages and it's going to generate an image on the fly uh, you know instead of having to write uh, uh, admittedly trivial but still having to write a docker file and build and push etc so this is generating the image on the fly and it was pretty quick right uh, with all the stuff we have in that image uh, the way it works is that it relies on nix and nix packages so all the layers that we have here actually pre-exist and all it does is put together an image manifest referencing these layers. It is absolutely cool and magic. The only downside
side is that it only generates whoops, uh, AMD64 images. So if you have multi-arch clusters, like the one I was showing earlier that Tiffany was showing us, um, then it won't quite work. Uh, there is support for ARM64 with some tricks. No support, like proper support for multiple architectures yet in that, but the Nixery maintainers are super open to contribution, so I don't despair that someday someone will uh, contribute that and make everything better for everyone. And that's it. That was a uh, 19 plus a uh, half plus three quarter. <laughs> uh, hopefully useful tricks uh, for Kubernetes. Thank you so much.